Thank you for joining us today. I am Sonia Visser. I'm the sales manager here at Hypothesis, and I'm going to turn it over to Christy DeCarolis, who is our customer success manager. Christy. Thanks, Sonia. <laughs> uh, and thanks, Kevin, for joining our conversation about favorite regional foods. I guess I'm the only person who's like thinking about lunchtime. Um, I was thinking earlier about uh, Sonia and I because we are the New Jersey hypothesis representatives. We're both from New Jersey, but Sonia's from North Jersey and I'm from South Jersey. And there is a debate over Taylor ham versus pork roll in New Jersey. And so it got me thinking about regional foods and that's kind of like our regional thing. Yeah, no, it's pork roll, Sonia. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, Kevin, I agree. Cheese steaks also a great regional food because I'm from the Philly suburbs. So um, I don't know if we have any people from Wisconsin. I would say like cheese curds if we're in that area. I think I'm just hungry. Um, so Thanks for joining the session about how I'm hungry this afternoon. Uh, actually, the session is called Why Hypothesis and not What is Christy Having for Lunch? Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, some different strategies that you might use on using uh, social annotation in your courses for student success. A lot of stuff I'm kind of going to be tying together from a bunch of different sessions. Um, so my apologies if you have heard some of these things before, but even I'm getting lots of new ideas as we move through our sessions yesterday uh, and I'm sure today as well. So thanks again for joining and my slides are I'm popping them in the chat now. Um, so I'll start out with going over what hypothesis is and why I think it's a powerful tool to use in your course. And then we'll kind of roll into some ideas on how you can prompt students to annotate and some different ways you can get started and some resources that we have for you. So gonna go through things quickly because we have just a half an hour together and I spent like two minutes talking about food. Uh, so <laughs> we will roll into it. Uh, as Sonia mentioned, my name is Christy DeCarolis. I'm a customer success manager here at Hypothesis. My background is in instructional design. So I've been in higher education for the last 10 years um, in instructional design and ed tech support. And I also adjunct and I use Hypothesis in my own teaching as well. So some of my tips come from just my own experiences in addition to working with lots and lots of faculty over the years and using Hypothesis in their courses. So the first thing I wanna start with is what it looks like to annotate with Hypothesis, but I wanna get a sense of what everyone's experience with Hypothesis is first to see how detailed I should go into this. So if you don't mind popping onto a slido.com and putting in the code here, um, you can take my poll and let me know, have you used hypothesis before? Um, or are you kind of just starting to explore? Because that will help me better understand, uh, again, like how, how detailed do we want to go into the what is hypothesis? I see a chicken wings came up in the chat. What is that considered a regional, what region, what region of the the U.S. or North America is represented by chicken? Ah, okay. Uh, apparently, I just don't know. Kevin is aware. <laughs> All right, so... It looks like some folks have taken the poll, so thank you. It looks like a lot of people are brand new um, and some people are power users. So if you are one of the people who is answering that you've used it extensively in your courses, please feel free to share in the chat different ways that you've had successes with Hypothesis because I always love to hear that. Um, so I'm going to pop in since we have some folks that have never used Hypothesis before and show you just the basics of what it looks like. Um, so I'm going to look in Canvas, but really our integration looks very similar no matter if you're using Canvas or one of the other major learning management systems. Um, so when I am in my Canvas site, I'm going to open up a reading. And your experience, again, will not be very different if you're using Brightspace, Blackboard, or Moodle. You would load a a document in with Hypothesis. In this example, I have an open educational resource, a physics textbook chapter, um, but we'll talk about what other documents you can use with Hypothesis. 
And basically what Hypothesis is letting me do is adding this sidebar on the right-hand side of the screen overlaid on top of this document that I've loaded into my course site. And uh, you'll notice that there are areas of the text that are highlighted on the left, and those areas of text are actually pieces of text that students have chosen to select and uh, add comments or questions. Um, so those pieces of uh, these annotations are anchored within the text itself. And when I hover over each annotation, you'll notice that the annotation on the left, um, the annotated text actually changes color too. So I can see exactly what word or phrase or sentence a student is discussing. In this case, for instance, Jennifer is annotating a equation. Um, she's kind of writing out the syntax for the equation. And you might have seen that some of the annotations have this option to show replies. And if I click on this show reply option, then I can expand a threaded discussion around this one piece of text. So the students here are really just discussing this one equation and they can have, you know, I can make an informed teaching decision about that. Uh, do I want to talk about this in class? Do I want to answer it here or see if another student can answer? Um, so I have more information about just that one specific piece of text and how the students are interpreting that. And as we go on, you'll see the students have other questions and other connections to other parts of the text as well. So that's what the, the basics of what hypothesis is letting us do. Um, let me get back to our slides. As I mentioned, uh, we work with all the major learning management systems, Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, Brightspace, and Sakai, so that when you open your readings, the students can start annotating right away. They don't have to log in or uh, create accounts or anything like that. The integration also allows you to set up your assignments within the learning management system. So you're not setting up assignments, again, like on, on a third party website, you actually set them up right within the learning management system and you can use the files in your course site. So it's really easy to get set up and you can grade within your course site as well. So why should you use Hypothesis in your courses? Uh, we like to say at Hypothesis that it makes reading active, visible. I think really what we've heard over the sessions, uh, you know, throughout the day yesterday is we're getting to the root of, um, you know, what makes students successful, and that is active engagement with course materials. Um, so student engagement and student belonging in their courses leads to student success, and we can incorporate those things with social annotation. So asking students to annotate is essentially asking them to engage in metacognition as they read the text. They have to think about, you know, what am I confused about? What do I connect with in this text? How am I interpreting this? Is it matching what other people are interpreting? So we're kind of enforcing them into a more active reading of the text. It but makes reading more visible for us as instructors because we can see how students are engaging with the text. Um, we can see what questions they have. Oftentimes my students are popping in and they are defining words that I didn't realize that they wouldn't know or asking questions about things that um, are surprising to me. So it reveals that reading process to us. And again, we can make informed teaching decisions about that. And it makes reading social for students. And I think this is where we have this belonging piece where students can see how other students are interpreting the text and feel more confident in their own interpretations of the text. In addition to, you know, if they can see that other students have the same questions that they do, that can help boost their confidence as well. Um, and we talked about some case studies yesterday, so I won't go into a ton of details around these. Um, we did see that using hypothesis does increase the amount of engagement that students have um, with the course text throughout the term. So oftentimes we see that students, as they progress through the semester, towards the end of the semester, they start to, you know, they stop reading the textbook if they were even doing it from the beginning um, because they get overloaded with their coursework. Adding hypothesis will keep them engaged to the end of the term. So I have about three weeks left in my class, and my students are doing the reading because they're annotating it. Their annotations are due tonight. Uh, so I know that they're getting into the reading still. 
We saw uh, Dr. Nick Denton present yesterday about his use of hypothesis in pharmacy courses, specifically with student identity around um, seeing themselves as a scientist. And I think that's really important to the piece of student belonging and enhancing student belonging and self-efficacy, they can start to see themselves as knowledge co-creators in their courses, as scholars. If they're passively doing the reading, they don't see themselves necessarily as scholars, right? They're just consuming content. But engaging with the content can help them see themselves as participants in that knowledge creation, which is really key, again, for their self-confidence and their success. We can make sure all of their student voices are included. So maybe some of the students that don't want to raise their hand in class, um, or if they uh, don't feel confident like in remembering what they have said about the text, we can bring up the annotations in class and use those uh, to drive the discussions. And I think Dr. Denton had some good examples in his presentation yesterday um, in the keynote, if you want to hop back and watch that recording about how he uses the annotations in journal clubs to help drive that active class discussion. And students like using hypothesis as well. So anecdotally, I see that with my own students. Um, my students give me feedback and course evaluations that they uh, feel that hypothesis helps them better learn the material. But we have seen that in research as well. So I want to hear a little bit about what you hope to do in your courses with hypothesis. So again, um, if you want to hop over to the Slido poll and let me know, we can kind of bring those in to the last half of our conversation. And I did see a question about group discussions. How can you produce several group and discussions for annotation? That is part of our LMS integration. Um, you can set up groups within your course site. So in Canvas, you would set up your Canvas group sets, similarly in Brightspace and Blackboard. Um, Moodle, I think they're called groupings. And then you can use those when you set up your hypothesis-enabled reading um, to uh, create separate annotation spaces. So I'll share some resources later on and where you can find our help documentation in the technical setup uh, for for that process, but you're using the group sets again in your own learning management system, in your own course site. Um, and someone asked, does this increase grading time since you will need to track their posted annotations? Um, so that's a really good question. And we have a grading integration, which um, is a little bit different in Canvas than in our other learning management systems because Canvas has SpeedGrader. But in all of our learning management systems, you can filter the student contributions by each individual student. So you can see what each individual student has added to the annotations, um, whether it's an original annotation or a reply. Um, and so it looks a little different in our non-Canvas LMSs, but same idea where here I'm just looking at Jennifer's um, annotations, and then I can move on and see another student's contributions. Uh, that is a good question. I think it depends on how you set up the grading, really. Uh, for example, in my class, I do a complete incomplete basis, so it tends to be pretty quick. Uh, I review the annotations and, you know, just give the students points if they have uh, completed the annotations. I invest some time in the beginning of the semester to give more specific feedback and make sure that students are contributing meaningfully to the conversation. But as the semester progresses, after I've given that feedback, they tend to, uh, you know, kind of learn from that. So if anyone else has any um, experiences to share that has used hypothesis about grading, you can share, uh, share that in the chat. That would be great. Um, so thanks for answering the poll. So we have a lot of just student engagement when they're discussing the reading. So that's connecting back to what Dr. Nick Denton was talking about yesterday. So I definitely check that out um, and see also trying to better figure out what students most and least understand in the reading. That has been incredibly helpful in my own experience as well. So let's continue on. Um, 
So how do we create these meaningful conversations? Once you all dive in, I think you'll see that technically hypothesis is pretty easy to get set up. We don't have a ton of clicks to get your reading hooked up to the annotation sidebar. And myself and our support team are always happy to get you started if you are having trouble. But where I tend to work with faculty more is crafting those meaningful conversations with our students. How do we hook the students into the conversations and get them to engage in a way that's going to lead to that comprehension and retention of information? Because if they just pop into the text and they're like, oh yeah, great point, cool. Uh, that is not going to lead to greater retention and comprehension. And sometimes our students are not explicitly taught how to engage with the text in a meaningful way. So how we prompt the students can really uh, impact the meaningful, the meaningfulness. I don't think that's a word, but uh, how meaningful the conversations are. So uh, I like to consider some different things when I work with faculty in um, creating their annotation assignments. So I always start out with what are your goals for annotation? Your goals might look different from someone else's. So a lot of you answered that you want to create more engaging, active class discussions. But if your goal is to have students um, you know, understand scholarly articles more, then we might prompt the students in a different way than if we're going to prompt them to lead to more engaging class discussions. Uh, so we have different things to think about as we're creating our assignment instructions, um, thinking about how frequently do we want our students to annotate. My students annotate every single week. So I basically give them the same kind of general instructions each week um, with a few exceptions because this is just a repeat assignment that they're doing. Um, and then it also might, the, the, the type of the reading and the length of your reading could also impact how you're going to um, prompt the students. So I was moderating a session yesterday with uh, Mar Mariana Laporte and um, Katie Pierce, and they use annotation in completely separate ways. Uh, it was a session on interdisciplinary insights. Katie has her students um, sharing three things they learned, two things they were confused about, and I'm getting that wrong. She shared a specific prompt she uses over course readings. Mariana was using a uh, hypothesis for students to engage with assignment instructions. So completely different types of readings. That's going to impact how we engage our students. So as we go through um, some of these examples, I will give you some links to get started at the end of this. Um, one thing that we heard Dr. Denton, Denton talk about yesterday is we can guide our students through the texts um, with our own annotations. And Katie Pierce also had a really good example of this in, in our discussion yesterday too, where she'll go in and add annotations with updated statistical figures or um, add in more contextual elements for students. So you can always go into the document before the students have a chance to get into the reading and add your own annotations, maybe questions for reflections at specific points in the reading or areas where you need to provide more context that can be helpful as well. Um, or if you're just kind of providing more information about technical language, you can really help guide your students through the text actively. Um, so I think in other instances, um, and what I do for most of the time is I just open the reading for questions, resources, and connections for my students. So there are some readings where I will go in and kind of seed with annotations, but a lot of times I kind of just like step back and let my students start the conversation. And then I use that to decide where to go with my conversation. Um, so I will bring up the instructions that, again, these are linked later in the slides, but these are really similar to what I use in my own course. Um, I'll ask my students to ask a question about something that's unclear or confusing to them, to paraphrase an important phrase or passage in their own words, uh, to connect a passage or idea to something they've learned in class already. I think this one is really key. Um, for example, I had one of my students recently in the first like two or three weeks of class, I, I teach a gender and technology class for context. Um, they read about certain 
criteria to look for in algorithms to try and determine whether the algorithm could be potentially dangerous. And then six weeks later, they're doing a reading about an algorithm used in social services. And one of my students comes out and she's like, this is an algorithm that, you know, using the criteria we learned about would be considered a dangerous algorithm because it meets the criteria with X, Y, and Z. And she kind of showed how she was connecting our course content through the semester without me even having to prompt her to do that. Um, so giving them prompts like this can be helpful in revealing those connections and how they're tying things together for you. Um, I see a question about, do students ever exhibit symptoms of annotation burnout? Uh, like I can see the tendency might be to go crazy with it at first and students get tired of it if it's used too much. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think there are a lot of different philosophies about how to approach uh, annotating with students. Uh, I tend to err on the side of, I don't force a set uh, number of annotations because some students will go in and they'll annotate a lot and some students will go in and maybe just add two. So I try to not be too prescriptive about how students are interacting with the text so that they can feel um, more engaged throughout the semester. But my students have given feedback that they do like that it holds them accountable for completing their readings and they do recognize that it helps them in the end. Um, there is kind of a natural like, ebb and flow with the students sometimes of like, I'll see, oh, they didn't, you know, annotate as much in this text, but they'll kind of come back a little bit later on. So I think it really depends on how you set up your assignments um, and what the individual students are experiencing. Um, but again, I, try, I tend to like not be super prescriptive in how I'm asking them to engage with the text. Uh, so in... STEM-related classes, I think asking students to practice key skills related to problem solving can be helpful. Um, so this is where some faculty will come to me and be like, I don't really see how I can use this outside of the humanities. But asking students to just clarify notation and syntax or explain how they would approach solving a problem can be helpful in revealing their thinking. And then finally, I think one of the really creative ways to use hypothesis is to annotate uh, ancillary course documents. So this is something we did here with Mariana yesterday um, in the interdisciplinary insights panel. She actually said that she first started using hypothesis only with course documents. So study guides, um, syllabus, uh, assignment instructions. If you have students annotate these things, you can see how are they interpreting the assignments. Um, and I actually just recently started doing this with my students, having them annotate project instructions really helped me figure out where I needed to clarify my own instructions and um, where my students were, were being confused about, about their approach. Um, and it also kind of helped with last minute emails not being so, so bad as well. So even if you just start with having students annotate the syllabus, that's a really great way to try out hypothesis um, in a kind of more low stakes way. And then one thing that I think is a little underutilized in hypothesis is that you can include multimedia in your annotations. So students can embed images in YouTube videos, and you can do that as well as the instructor. And that opens up the possibility for a really multimodal way of reading. Um, and that is kind of a key principle of UDL. Oh, Katie is here, and I'm just like talking about all the things that Katie was, <laughs> was saying yesterday. Hi, Katie. Um, so as I scroll through, I'm going to try and find this example. Um, I have one example with, you know, this momentum um, image. If we don't, this is what I'm really looking for. The law of when conservation of momentum ball. is actually best represented by a video, not necessarily through text. So embedding this multimedia can help uh, students better understand the concepts that they're reading in text. Um, and Katie asks, when people are having students annotate the syllabus, are you making those assignments in your course management system? So I, I do personally. I would love to hear if other people do that in the chat. Um, but like I said, my my grades are kind of just like a, a pass fail. 
part of the participation. So I do have students like that's their first participation grade of the semester is annotating the syllabus. Uh, the last piece I want to mention is that I know AI has been a big target of conversation in a higher ed over the last 18 months. And I think we can use social annotation in response to AI. Um, a lot, a uh, kind of low stakes way of having social, uh, of using social annotation as a response to AI is to have maybe ChatGPT or another large language model respond to one of your prompts and then have students annotate that. So I worked with a faculty member who had ChatGPT answer a prompt and she told her students, I would give this a six out of 10, annotate it and tell me how you would make it a 10 out of 10. So I think something like that could be an interesting way to show students what the strengths and weaknesses of these AI tools are. Um, and then the annotations themselves, again, we're seeing students as knowledge co-creators. How can we bring that community into our assessments? So for instance, I have my students um, do reflections where they cite their classmates' annotations and how it changed their way of thinking or reinforced their way of thinking. So how can we bring the community into our assessments? Because that's something that maybe AI can't have access to at this point, at least. <laughs> All right, so we are getting towards the last couple of minutes of our session. I just want to give you a quick rundown of the types of documents you can annotate. So I know we've had some questions in the chat. Most folks are using PDFs within their learning management system, but you can also annotate publicly accessible web pages and online articles, um, open textbooks and open educational resources. YouTube video transcripts and Canvas Studio is coming. We are considering what, you know, video platforms to use in the future in addition to YouTube. And then you can use JSTOR stable URLs. And if you're a vital source independent school, we have an integration with vital source eText as well. I mentioned multimedia annotations. So there are links in the slide on how you can add multimedia to your annotations themselves. And then if you are interested in learning more about how to get Hypothesis set up in your own course, we have getting started guides for each of our major learning management systems. So each of these links will take you to a guide that takes you from literally like how, what can you use this with, um, a video, how to get it set up in your, uh, in your LMS, how can you group the students, how can you grade, all on one page. So those getting started guides are a great place to literally get started. And then our starter assignments are sample instructions so that your students have a meaningful conversation are linked in the deck as well. So I'll pop the slides back into the chat so you have access to those and you can use those in your course or adapt them as needed. I'm gonna skip that poll because we're low on time. Go forward. Um, and then we are coming in at 12.30, so I want to let everyone go to the next session. Our final few slides do have some opportunities for Hypothesis partners, and if you're not a partner, you can learn more about what you get if your school does partner with us. So things like pedagogical support, access to Hypothesis Academy, if you want to register for our asynchronous learning opportunities, um, and then promotions that we're running as well as upcoming events. Um, so please make sure to check out um, more information in the slides. I know we went through a lot in the last 25 minutes um, and you can meet our team members if you have specific questions in the expo hall in Zoom events. So hop on over there if you need any assistance with getting started and one of our team members will help you out. So thanks all for joining again, and I will see you in our future sessions. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone.